today is uh, we are seeking to hear from Jesus. Amen. Solely from him, uh, unlike that removal of distraction, wisdom against deception, and just trusting in, in him. Um, we good, Neil? Wonderful. So from Revelation chapter 2, uh, this is the third letter in a series of seven letters from, from Jesus through the Apostle John to, to seven churches in, in Asia Minor. Uh, if you think back with me, we've already been in Ephesus and we've been in Smyrna. And the letter to the church in Ephesus really was all about the heart of the believer. As a church, they were doing everything right. They had every service they could possibly have. They were doing all the community outreach that they could possibly do. But Jesus said, I've got one thing against you, and that is a big thing, and it's that you've left your first love. The church had forgotten the motive, the purpose behind what they were doing. And then we came to Smyrna, Smyrna being the persecuted church. One of the churches that Jesus writes to where he says nothing wrong against them. Everything they're doing was good and was faithful in the sight of the Lord. They were being obedient, even in the midst of heavy, hard persecution. Persecution which even led to many of them being martyred for their faith. And so this morning we're going to come to the letter to the church of Pergamos. And if we think to Ephesus, Jesus, the message to Ephesus was, I want all of you. I want every single part of you. I want it all. And then to Smyrna, what he wants from the believers in Smyrna for us is our faithfulness and our obedience in the face of hardship. And what we're going to learn today from this church here in Pergamos is this. Jesus' desire is that none of us would compromise in our faith. And we're going to be talking a bit about Satan, about the enemy of God's people the enemy of the church of Jesus Christ. And if you think about how Satan works, he works in different ways. Strategy number one, which we see against the church in Smyrna, was this full-on frontal attack. And it didn't work. In fact, this attack on the church in Smyrna really, really lacked all effectiveness, and it made these believers in Jesus more faithful to their God. And so the second strategy of Satan, of our enemy, is this, infiltration. If you can't beat them, then join them. We see that there are going to be wolves within this church. There are deceivers, there are manipulators, there are false teachers and false prophets. People within the church, within the body of Christ, who are there with ulterior motives. They are not there to worship and glorify God. They are there for their own gain. They are there to draw people and attention to themselves, to puff themselves up. And sadly, if we look at church history, this strategy of the enemy, it works. This strategy of coming within the church of Jesus Christ, it works. Truth can be distorted. The gospel can be watered down. Believers are distracted. And believers are directed off of the narrow path. Throughout history, there have been many fake Christians following a fake Christianity, teaching a fake Jesus, a false Christ. And this is a danger, especially in the the days we're living in, that we all need to be aware of, that we all need to be prepared for, and we all need to be guarded against. And so therefore, Jesus is going to write to this church In Pergamos, it is the compromising church. It is a church that's quite literally married itself to the world. It's joined itself to the culture that it's surrounded by. And I wonder if you think about the church that we are in, the wider church, how many different denominations, how many different groups have in fact married themselves to the world. How many different churches have been shaped by culture rather than conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? I would say that this is not just the compromising church, but this is the tolerant church. 
And if you think about the past 30, 50 years, the contemporary church that we know really has done all that it can to be like the world. The church, the contemporary church, has done all that it can to be like the world. To, to draw people in, to entertain, to motivate, to build up, to send out. To draw in the numbers simply so they have more bums on pews. Simply so they can get more money into their organization. And this isn't every church, but in the contemporary church, we can see that they are, and there are many who are replicating the methodologies and the strategies of the world. And what Jesus is saying is this is in fact corruption. And this is compromise of the gospel of Jesus. And so we're going to look at this letter, Revelation chapter 2 this morning, and just really consider what Jesus might say to us as a fellowship, but also to us as individuals. So you're going to stand with me this morning, please, for the reading of Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12 and go all the way down to verse 17. It says, Unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. And Father, I just pray that as we come to your word this morning, that we would have hearts which are softened, which are willing to, to be changed, to be molded, to be shaped. Lord, I pray for a removal of all distraction. God, give us a focus that surpasses our own capacity this morning. Give us attention, Lord. I know we need attention um, in this room today to hear your voice, to hear your word. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. So as with all of these letters, it's, it's important for us to, to start off with some, some context. Um, really to understand exactly why Jesus is saying what he's saying. Because without context, some of this just doesn't make as much sense. Historically, uh, Pergamos was in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. It, it's about 100 miles north of Ephesus. It's no longer a port city like we've been looking at in the past two letters. It's inland. It's part of some trading routes, but it's, it's not really that wealthy because of trade. But it is one of the most prominent cities in the area for a very different reason. It's a cultural hub. It's a hub of intellect. In this city, we could call it a university town. It's full of academics. It's full of people who are coming and flocking to the second largest library in the whole world. It's got over 200,000 handwritten manuscripts. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of knowledge that people are flocking towards. In this city, it was a very much a center of education and a center of learning. Spiritually, it was a center for pagan worship. The worship of man-made idols, the worship of man-made gods. Uh, the streets were literally littered with temples. Temples to Greek gods, temples to Roman gods, and just as we found in Smyrna, a huge temple dedicated to the worship of Caesar. Emperor worship was, was essentially rife in this city. It was pagan in culture and religion. And because of that, it was steeped in sexual immorality. All of these foreign gods so much of their religion and so much of their practice of worship 
was related to sexual immorality. And despite all of their learning, all of their knowledge and intellect, um, this city didn't always rely upon that, that earthly knowledge. What they relied upon heavenly was their superstition and was their worship of foreign gods. This was a center for, for healing. It had the best place to go to to be healed from your physical illnesses and your physical ailments. Can we get the, the slide up, please, Margaret? In, in, this, in this city, there was this huge temple, this magnificent temple to this, this god, um, Asclepius. Now, Asclepius was, was the god of healing and of knowledge. And people from all over the world would come to this temple in Pergamos if they're ill, if they're physically uh, deformed, they would come here. And what they would do is they would go into this temple and, and they would lie down in this temple, maybe for a day, maybe overnight. And this temple was full of snakes, living snakes. Now, they weren't poisonous. They weren't harmful. But your, your idea was, your hope was, you came to this city, you lay down in this temple overnight, and you wanted a snake to crawl over, well, slide over you. You wanted a snake to touch you. Because with that belief and hope that this God would heal you, that as this snake touched you, you would be cleansed, healed from your diseases. And why do you think so many people came from so far? Because it worked. People were healed. People were cured of diseases. And so people came here not to rely upon the knowledge just of the universities, also the worship of these pagan and foreign gods. This was essentially a sleepover with snakes, which sounds horrific. Yeah, it makes your skin crawl. But this is where we find our church, okay, in Pergamos. This is where we find our church, a city of intellectual pride and education. Pride and education. What does that remind you of? Cambridge, where we're living today. And not just Cambridge, but many cities within the Western Hemisphere, where they build themselves up because of their prowess and their intellectual ascents. Uh, not only that, but this is a city of idolatry. Sounds a bit like Cambridge and sexual immorality. Again, Cambridge, but you could pick any Western city. But this is where we find ourselves at this church in Pergamos. This is the pressures that these Christians were under, living in this city, where people flocked there for intellect, but they also flocked there for the worship of these foreign gods. And so Jesus, he starts this letter and he says to the angel, remember that word angel, which means messenger. It's the pastor, the minister of the church in Pergamos. And the introduction is this. These things says he who has the sharp, two-edged sword. This is not the kind of letter that you necessarily want to receive from Jesus. This is not the introduction that you want to be heard read out on a Sunday morning. This is from he. Who's that he? Jesus. And what's he bringing? He's bringing a two-edged sword. This is not a short sword. This is a Thracian broadsword. This is the kind of sword that could cut people in two. It was long. It was deadly. It was sharp. And it should give us, as we begin this letter, the image of judgment. And it should give us the image of distinction and separation as things are split in two. And where does judgment begin? It begins in the house of God. And this is the judgment, as they're reading this letter, that this church will be facing. It's a judgment that all churches will face. It's a judgment that we as individuals will also face. And it's a really healthy reminder for us that we must keep what as the standard? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. That has to be our ultimate go-to standard as a church and as individual believers in Jesus. And I think it's a really healthy question for churches to ask and also for individuals to ask, where is Jesus in your life? Where is he positioned in your life? Is he the ultimate standard? Is he your go-to? Is he the one that you rely upon, that you lean upon? 
Do you fear him rightly as the one who holds the two-edged sword that will bring judgment? And it's a just judgment, but it's judgment nonetheless. And Jesus goes on in verse 13 and says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I think it's really encouraging, and I said this, I think probably in the previous, both previous messages, it's really encouraging and comforting for me to know that God knows about me. Is that not encouraging? That God knows what we're doing? And God knows the situation and circumstances that we find ourselves in. That's what he's saying to these, these believers here in Pergamos. I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. And I also know the city that you're living in. I know the culture you're surrounded by. I know the pressures that you face. And I get it. I see you. I recognize you. That should comfort you. That should comfort each one of us to know that God cares enough to recognize you as an individual as a person, to see what you're doing and how you're doing it. And he wants us to encourage us to do more for him, to seek him, to honor him in how we live our lives. Because if we think about Pergamos, it was not straightforward being a Christian. It was not straightforward being a Christian. You were surrounded by people worshiping foreign gods. You were surrounded by intellectual pride you were surrounded by think back to the letter to Smyrna the one day a year where you had to bow down to Caesar and call him Lord that was still mandatory here in Pergamos and so you face all of these situations as a believer in Jesus and not only that but we read here that you dwell where Satan's throne is where Satan resides, where he has made his little dominion there on earth, where Satan dwells. Now, what does this mean? There's only one Satan. He is not present in all places at all times. And at this point, it would appear that this is where he has chosen to dwell. If we look at the slide on the screen, it could be linked to this altar here which is the altar of Zeus. Now, this, this city was surrounding a, a, a mountain, uh, and this altar of Zeus uh, was built before the other two temples there that you see on the top of the mountain. So this, this altar to Zeus, which is now referred to as Satan's throne, was in one of the most prominent positions uh, of the city. And so wherever you were, you were essentially in the shadow of this altar. And that carries with it this, this oppression, spiritual oppression. It's there at all times. One commentator that I read said that Pergamos was the epicenter of evil, where Satan had his throne, where Satan dwells. This was the epicenter of evil. And just imagine the spiritual oppression of living there. Everything in this city Everything in this culture was drawing men and women away from God. Everything was pulling the Christian back into a life of sin, back into the hands of Satan. What I find really interesting, if you go to the next slide, please, Margaret. Um, Satan's throne, this, this structure, this, this altar to Zeus where, where sacrifices were made, uh, a German bloke, decided it was a great idea to remove this brick by brick um, and ship it across uh, uh, to Berlin. Um, uh, and they built it, um, and it's in the museum now in Berlin. I think in the next year or two, you can go and visit it, if you so choose. Uh, and this, this is there now. And uh, a really clever guy decided that he would take the blueprint to this, this altar to Zeus, this Satan's throne, and he would use that and build podiums to make these speeches from. What was that man's name? Adolf Hitler. And so we see that there was some power, some supernatural forces at work 
through this structure as it was in Pergamos, but then later in history. There we go, some information for you. Uh, there are some really good videos on YouTube. I will recommend some videos on YouTube to watch all about Satan's throne and the history of it as well. But what I want to focus and move on to this. It was in this spiritual climate where Satan's throne was, where Satan himself dwelt, that God, Jesus, praised these believers for this, for holding fast to his name. Consider your life right now. How would you do if you were faced with this sort of oppression, this culture, this climate, spiritual climate, would you hold fast to the name of Jesus? On that day when you were supposed to burn incense to Caesar and declare him as Lord, would you be able to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior? They didn't deny anything of Jesus. And not only that, it says that they did not deny their faith. They held fast in this spiritual oppression. Even to the point where we read of this man Antipas, this martyr. Martyr there just means witness. He's a witness of Jesus. Even as he was martyred, even as he was killed for his faith, they did not budge. If you read historically, there's not much about Antipas at all. But what there is, is how he died. He was roasted alive in a brazen bull altar. If that's not satanic, then I don't know what is. Simply because he would not deny the name of Jesus. You think it's hot in here today? Pressure was on. And I wonder, are, are we ready? Am I ready? Would I be ready to stand up against such firm opposition? When the world is calling us to follow another God. When the world is calling us to compromise our gospel. When the world is calling us to just be a bit tolerant of certain things. Are we going to stand up for our faith? Will we stand up for our faith when that day comes? Because that day will come. And you do not want to be a compromising Christian. That's the good stuff. But in verse 14, Jesus says this, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. I want you to notice in these two verses, there's a very clear distinction between you and them. Meaning, in this church, there were still those who were faithful. That's the you. And then he's going to write to those who are the them, who are the ones who are leading the you astray. Does that make sense? So even as Jesus is writing this letter, there's a clear separation and distinction between those who are in the faith and those who are outside of the faith. Now, if we think about what happened in Smyrna, the enemy, Satan, came against the church. But here, the enemy of the church was not just the culture that surrounded it. It, it wasn't the temples to other gods. It wasn't the worship of, of, of idols. The enemy that came against the church was the false teaching that had corrupted and had polluted the message of the cross. The enemy was not successful in penetrating the church. And so what the enemy did was it infiltrated the church. Infiltration followed by deception. Infiltration followed by deception. Because infiltration can go unnoticed, can it not? Infiltration in itself can go unnoticed. And even deception at the start can go unnoticed. But what Jesus is going to say is that we need to be aware and we need to be prepared. Now, how do I know that this is working? 
because Jesus is writing a letter to a church where clearly it has worked. This is not theoretical. This has happened throughout church history. Now, to compromise means this. Compromise means to accept lower standards than are acceptable. So to accept lower standards than are acceptable. Now, what is our standard as a believer in Jesus? It's the word of God, which is truth. It's the spirit of God that dwells within us, which is truth. And it's the person of Jesus Christ who himself is the truth. That is our standard. So if we are compromising, it means that we are dropping below whose standard? God's standard. And so that's how you know if you're compromising, if you've dropped below anything that is in the word of God, even by a fraction, that in itself is compromise. And if we look at this church here in Pergamos, members of the church were being sucked back into sinful living. Now if you go back through history, God has always been interested in his people being pure. He's always been interested in his people being separate. And he's always been interested in his people being holy. Can you put up the next slide? We're going to look in Leviticus chapter 18. Now, as we come into Leviticus 18, there's so many laws to follow. There's so many rules to follow. This chapter is all about sexual morality. And it's about keeping yourself separate, keeping yourself holy and pure. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. What's the best way to keep yourself pure? Make sure you're only worshipping one God, who is Jesus. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwell, you shall not do. Essentially, Moses, God through Moses is saying, think back to where you came from. Think back to Egypt. All of the things that they did, you yourself should not do. If you think about Egypt as a picture throughout Scripture, Egypt is a picture of the world. And so for you and me as a believer in Jesus, it's just say to us, do not look back to the life that you lived and do the same. Do not look back to the past and continue in those sins. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, so where you're going, where I'm bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. Meaning now as Christians, do not pollute yourself or corrupt yourself with the things that the culture calls acceptable. Not only do they call them acceptable, but they're celebrated, even revered and worshipped and held high for months of the year, literally. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord your God. From the beginning, God's always been so clear about his people keeping themselves separate from the world. And it's the same for us as the church of Jesus Christ. We are to be separate from the culture we're living in, to be distinct, to be completely, utterly different. And if you think about the New Testament, we've always been warned of what is to come. We've always been warned of the future. Margaret, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, we look at Matthew first. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. If someone's coming to you in sheep's clothing, what do they look like? Like a sheep. Are you going to recognize them as a wolf? Not until you see their fruits. How long could they be hidden in sheep's clothing for? Long time hidden in plain sight. Then Jesus says in Matthew 24, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. Do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, even the church of Jesus Christ, coming in from the inside out. But then look, see, I've told you beforehand, Jesus always warns us of what is to come. In Acts chapter 20, next slide please, Margaret, we have Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders before he leaves them. Remember, where's Ephesus? It's only 100 miles south. So this is very relevant to our church in Pergamos. 
He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. We are the redeemed. What was the price? Jesus. That's who we are as the bride of Christ. For I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And this is the scary part. Also, from among yourselves, so from within, from within, strategy number two of Satan, from within, men will rise up speaking perverse things to do what? To draw away disciples to themselves. It's always about making themselves better than the pastor, the elder, or even Jesus himself. And that is someone you should be very cautious of. Paul then writing to his son in the faith, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn away, turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Again, Jesus warned us, Paul also warns us, be watchful, be aware of what may come to the church. And this is what Jesus is highlighting for this church in Pergamos. And this is this is relevant for us today. We have so much information at our fingertips coming into our ears through our eyes. We need to be aware of different churches and what they are into and getting up to, as well as ourselves and judging ourselves by the word of God, by being Bereans. Because this can happen easily and it can happen quickly in so many different places. So if we look at the two doctrines that, that Jesus highlights here, Firstly, the doctrine of Balaam. It says that here that the, the doctrine of Balaam is about placing a stumbling block. So it's about creating a, a barrier or a separation between God and God's people. Now this, this happens uh, very simply and quite often very quickly. This happens by mixing with the world. That's what it is. It's a mixing with the world. Now, we read of um, Balaam twice in the New Testament, apart from here in Revelation, once in 2 Peter, and then again in Jude. And it was all about drawing people into idolatry and into sexual immorality. So in 2 Peter it says, but these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speaking of false teachers here, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing their own deceptions, while they what? Feast with you. In that day, in that custom, when you have a meal with someone, that means you're accepted. That means you belong. You have food with family, right? And so these people are literally there teaching amongst the people having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot see from sin. And then look at this, enticing unstable souls. Enticing unstable souls. If you're a predator, who would you go for? You go for the weak. You go for the isolated. You go for the lonely. You go for the easy targets. Enticing unstable souls. It says they have a heart trained in covetous practices, meaning that they desire things that they don't have. Things that God hasn't blessed them with and are accursed children. They've forsaken the right way and they've gone astray. How have they gone astray? By following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now if we think about this story, and I want to encourage you in the coming week, uh, read Numbers 22 to 24 just to get the full context. We're not going to do it this morning, but please do. Balaam, uh, he was a man who heard from God. But really, he was a sorcerer. And he knew of God, the God of Israel, because of what God of Israel had done for God's people. But essentially, what Balaam was, was a prophet for hire. He told prophecies in return for wages. And he was brought in by Balak, uh, who was the king of Moab. And if you remember the story, Balak... uh, the king of the Moabs was essentially scared of the children of Israel and the God of Israel, and he called in this sorcerer, this prophet, 
And he said to Balaam, what I want you to do is I want you to put a curse upon the children of Israel. Balaam said, I can only speak what God tells me to speak. And he does. And he never curses the children of Israel. Because every time God says, I want you to speak a blessing upon the children of Israel. And if you can imagine, this king of Moab was getting madder and madder and madder. And so what Balaam did, instead of cursing the people, he gave him advice. And what he said to him was essentially this, to defeat the children of God and put in the church here instead of the children of God, to defeat the church, instead of cursing them, you need to corrupt them. You need to pollute the people. If we can have a look, Margaret, at the next slide uh, from number 25. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They began to join themselves with these women. So instead of cursing them, Balaam was like, all you got to do is send in some nice young ladies and draw them away. And look what happens after that. It says, then they invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods. And why not, right? You're in their land. You're married to, the, to their women. Why not go along with them to their services? And then the people ate, okay, but then they bowed down to these foreign gods. And you can see in this small instance how corruption happens so quickly. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. This was the strategy. If you can't curse them, then what you've got to do is you've got to corrupt them. And this has happened in the church for centuries where the deception of this teaching waters down the message of the gospel. What it does, it sells people a false Jesus, a wrong type of Jesus. A Jesus that says you can have the world and me. A Jesus that says you can choose the parts of my gospel and my word that you want, and that's okay. It's a very tolerant, it's a very inclusive message. And if we think about our the church as a whole today, this is where we've got to, where there's so much confusion about gender and identity and sexuality within the world, and that's creeping to the church. Where the rates of, of, of marriage and divorce and remarriage are pretty much the same in the church as they are outside of the church. And that's been accepted, and that's been celebrated and put up high. The church where sin is no longer called sin and no longer discussed, almost swept under the carpet. Where repentance is barely ever mentioned. Don't use the hell word. Definitely don't talk about Satan. Because if you talk about these hard topics, what's going to happen? People are going to feel uncomfortable and people are going to leave. And the church of Jesus Christ today, the broad church, the compromised church, is allowing people in and doing all that they can to keep them there with the entertainment, the smoke machines, which James still won't let me buy. But it's a watering down of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Balaam was a corrupter of the people. That's what he did. And this doctrine of Balaam is essentially the same. It is a corruption of the Word of God. It's undermining the authority of Scripture. It's undermining the authority and person of Jesus. And it's drawing people back into a life of corruption, idolatry, and sexual immorality. And the same tactics are still at work today in the church. And so we must be aware and we must be prepared now, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, we're not going to spend much time here, but the word, if you break it down, Nicolaitans, Nicolaos, it means to conquer the people. So you have people within the church, and their sole ambition is to dominate. It is to take advantage of. And it's to draw people away into your way of living. And they themselves uh, were also very uh, loose with morality. In fact, uh, one commentator said that they lived lives of self-indulgence and drew others into the same. 
Uh, and these people were, were there in the church here at Pergamos. And so what does Jesus say to the inclusive church? What does he say to the tolerant church? The compromised church. What does he say to the compromised believer? The tolerant believer who won't call sin, sin. He says this in verse 16. He says, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You know, we hear this message of repent so often in these letters from Jesus to the seven churches. And all Christians are called to repentance. All non-believers are called to repentance. Repentance is not a negative thing. In fact, repentance is an invitation. Repentance is an invitation for those who have fallen away from God to come home. It's an invitation for those who have never met God to come to Him. What repentance is, is this. It is a positive mood move towards God. And that's what Jesus is saying here to the compromised church and believers. I want you to come back to me. I want you to do a 180, turn it around, and come back into my loving embrace. Or else. How many parents have ever used that expression with their kids? Or else. Jesus means it though, right? Jesus means it. There's a choice here. There's a choice for Christians throughout church history to choose whether or not they repent. If you are compromised in any part of your faith, how you represent Christ, how you speak about Christ, then there's an opportunity for you to repent, to turn around, to come back to Him. Or else. What's the or else? Who's going to come? How is He going to come? With a two-edged sword that is sharp, that is deadly, that is dangerous, that's a picture of judgment and of separation. If individuals don't repent, if churches don't repent, then Jesus is going to come. And he is going to bring judgment upon those in the churches. Remember what it says in James 4 verse 4. It says, friendship with the world is enmity towards God. Hostility. Warfare. So if you as a believer or as a church is choosing to mix the world with the church, then what you're doing is essentially you're saying, I am at war with God. And who's going to win that battle? It's not us. It's not the church. It's Jesus Christ who's going to win that battle. The message of this letter to this church and to us as believers and this church is do not be tolerant of sin. Do not be tolerant of sin. And guard against those who are coming into the church. I think there are two major concerns that Jesus has here. One is that these people have come into the church. That's a concern. But we can all fall short in that area. We can easily be infiltrated. The second major concern is this, though. You've allowed them to stay. You as a church, you as a leadership, have not moved them on, have not pushed them away from you as a body, as a family. That's a major concern that they remain there because the longer they remain there, the more influence that they can have. That is dangerous. So Jesus says, repent. Turn back from this. Because the body of Christ is to be distinct. Distinctly different. It was, it was said earlier, I think, in, the, in our time of prayer this morning about being salt and light. That's an individual's response, but it's also the church's response. We have to be different to the culture. If you're entering into a church and it's just the same as it is out there, then why would you bother? Because if I consider entertainment, no offense to Christians, the world can do a better job. They can put way more money into it and they can have a bigger, better, wilder experience than the church could ever do. So why would you go to a church for entertainment? I'm not here to be entertained. I'm here to meet with the living God. I'm here to worship my creator. 
I'm here because I know that without him, I am desperately in need of something else. And nothing else can provide. Nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else can lead me and guide me the way that God can. So why would I go anywhere else but the word of God? His church. The faithful church. And so Jesus ends his letter. He says, he who has an ear. So if, you're, if you have an ear, how many ears do you have? Two. You've got no excuses. You've got one. You've got two. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna to eat. I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Everyone has to be on guard. Every church, every believer has to be on guard because this could easily happen to you or me. We as a leadership team, we have to be on guard. We have to be holding the word of God high above all things, exalting the name of Jesus. And to the overcomer, who's the overcomer in this situation? The overcomer is the uncompromising Christian. It's a Christian who's standing firm upon their faith, even in the place where Satan dwells. Even in the place where Satan has put his throne, the overcomer is the one who is not giving in. He's the one who's standing true and firm upon his faith. And we have three promises here that we receive as the overcomers. By the way, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Hold that in mind. Number one, the hidden manna. Manna, the bread of life. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. We have the promise of Jesus, our ultimate provision. He, he's there for us. Secondly, we receive a white stone. Now, it's us. This might not make much sense. It probably doesn't make any sense. But there, there are different ways of looking at this. I'm going to take one for this morning. In athletics, if you finish the race and you win the race, you receive a white stone. It's a stone of victory. It's to single you out as someone who is victorious. And then more than that, it's also your entry ticket into the feast for victor. And so Jesus here is saying to us, I'm giving you, if you overcome, I'm giving you victory. I am the victor. I've overcome. And that's your entrance into this wonderful feast where we receive every spiritual blessing that's in Christ Jesus because of who he is. Thirdly, not only do we get this stone, this stone has upon it a name. It says it's a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. That can mean many things. But reading this, it, it means it's a message, of, to me, it's a message of approval. That we're receiving a, a name from him. That's intimate. That's personal. Think about you maybe and, and your spouse, your, your husband, your wife, or your parents. And they have a special name for you. A pet name. It just symbolizes to me this picture of, of acceptance and love and belonging. We have a new name. The new name has a new quality. Um, we have a new name also because we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But, but notice that these three promises, they only come if we hold fast to the standard of God's will. And that's what I want to encourage you in this morning. Stand fast upon God's word and stand fast upon God's will. See, I mean, if we look at the church around us, really the church as a whole is in, is in crisis. Church buildings being sold, church buildings being empty, numbers in churches just dropping and dwindling, people thinking they can have the world on a Sunday and the church rather than separate themselves out. The church is in, in crisis. But as we see here, it is possible to stand firm upon the name of Jesus even where Satan dwells. It's possible to not deny your faith, even where the throne of Satan is. But it's in him. We can't do this of ourselves. We need him. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to rely upon the word of God. Amen? Father, we thank you that even though there are many deceptions and many 
lies and falsehoods and half-truths. We thank you that we can rely upon your word, which is the truth. We can rely upon the spirit that dwells in us, who is the spirit of truth. And we can rely upon you, Jesus. Lord, I pray you strengthen each one of us. Lord, any who has compromised, any who has fallen short of that standard, who has slipped, God, I pray for just a spirit of conviction that would lead us to repentance. And Lord, for each of us, I pray that this would be an encouragement, that even in the face of such oppression, we, we can be faithful. Because there are so many, countless before us who have done the same. Relying upon you, trusting in you. Lord, we thank you that you are a faithful God, a loving and merciful God. Lord, I pray you continue to teach us through these words, which is the word. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.